To many 19th century Americans, the West is a vast, untamed frontier, a place where rugged pioneers are carving out a new social order. But in reality, cultures have existed on these lands for centuries. The Great Plains of the United States has been a meeting ground for thousands and thousands of years, a place of convergence, a place uh, where people from many different places have come together, uh, sometimes in cooperation, um, quite often in collision. Uh, and that has been going on from, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, from the earliest uh, time of human habitation, certainly in the 19th century West, uh, this was true. The peopling of the West is not simply a case of people moving from the East into the West. It has been a process stretching back over centuries of people coming from the Far East, meaning from Asia, and moving East into the West, or from Mexico and Latin America and moving North. And it seems to me that if we really want to understand the history of the American West, we do need to understand it as being peopled from many directions. But if we're going to call it a West, we have to understand that that is already uh, indicating a particular orientation, and it's not an unimportant one. Western United States has always been one of the most diverse parts of the country. And by diversity here, I mean not only racial diversity, but also ethnic diversity. Much immigration flows into the western parts. I think North Dakota is the most heavily immigrant state in 1890. It's more heavily immigrant than New York or Massachusetts. We're also going to have, during this period, a migration picking up again, which will be from Mexico in the late 19th, early 20th century, moving in, which had been stalled a little bit in the late 19th, but it moves in again. We're having people from all over the world moving into the western United States. And this continued movement of population is another major development that takes place Place during this period. Indian tribes inhabited western lands long before other groups begin venturing into the territory. Some had been here since their ancestors crossed the Bering Straits. Others, like the Cherokee and Creek, are forcibly pushed westward from their homes in the southeast. One of the things we have to keep in mind when we talk about Indian peoples in the American West is that there are some forms of social organization which are really very old. Uh, Zuni Pueblo, the Zunis were Zunis for a very long time. But a lot of the people who today are tribes were created by the history of contact itself. Sometimes these organizations are old, they have deep roots in the past. Sometimes what they are is they're people who come together simply because they're remnants of older groups that have merged together now into a larger group as they die from disease or as they're pushed out of territory by either Europeans or other Indian peoples. Other times they're forms of social organization created by, literally by the treaty process itself. The Pueblo of the Southwest, primarily farmers, established permanent settlements centuries before the Spanish arrived. For a long time after their first contact with Europeans, Indian peoples remained quite independent. After all, Coronado comes in in 1540, and it's going to be really the 1880s before the last of the um, Indian populations are really subdued in the western United States. There's a substantial amount of time in which Indians do coexist independently alongside Europeans. The Plains Indians, a large and diverse group of tribes, often collide with each other and with the settlers who intrude upon their territory after the Civil War. We heard that some white men were measuring land to the south of us. In company with a number of other warriors, I went to visit them. We could not understand them very well, for we had no interpreters. But we made a treaty with them by shaking hands and promising to be brothers. Then we made our camp near their camp, and they came to trade with us. Every day they measured land with curious instruments and put down marks which we could not understand. And after the Civil War, uh, white Americans began moving into new areas, areas that had only been controlled by Indian people before. But now, uh, non-natives were coming into the area and competing. And the, the competition was through farming and ranching. And the ranch animals, especially uh, livestock, would compete with Indian people for the native foods, the uh, fruits and the vegetables, the nuts that were a natural part of the diet of Indian people. Native population Indian peoples is overwhelmed by, by outsiders. One of the interesting things that, that Anglo-Americans are able to do is even though they're newcomers to the region themselves, they define themselves as natives and everybody else becomes immigrants and outsiders. 
the Plains Indians find that even their way of life becomes endangered. In the Great Plains, they lost uh, the buffalo. This was done on purpose so that uh, the tribes would have to come into the reservations. And then there, the United States was supposed to provide sufficient food for the people, but it was never sufficient. In the Northwest, it was the fish that, that ultimately were destroyed. In various areas, the foodstuffs that people uh, ate uh, were destroyed, and it, and it harmed, harmed the people biologically. After this trouble, all of the Indians agreed not to be friendly with the white men anymore. There was not general engagement, but a long struggle followed. Sometimes we attacked the white men, sometimes they attacked us. First a few Indians would be killed, and then a few soldiers. I think the killing was about equal on each side. The number killed in these troubles did not amount to much, but this treachery on the part of the soldiers had angered the Indians and revived memories of other wrongs so that we never again trusted the United States troops. <laughs>